So what we're going to be talking about today is polyglot data. How many have ever heard of polyglot data? How many have heard of polyglot ever? Before we get into polyglot data, though, I'm going to go through a bit about a thing called event sourcing. Has anyone here ever heard of event sourcing? Wow, it's more than usual. In America, it's normally like two people. In Europe, it's like 200 people. Now, I've been talking about event sourcing for a long, long time. This is actually off of the QCon website from 2007. This is actually the second time I talked about event sourcing at QCon. The first time, I think, was 2006, QCon San Francisco. No one had ever heard about the ideas before. I go in, and my front row is Martin Fowler, Eric Evans, Gregor Hope. I had never met any of them before. I went through my entire talk in about 22 minutes. And afterwards, Eric comes to me and said, that was a really bad talk. I was like, oh, thanks. Event sourcing is not a difficult idea. What's interesting for me when we start talking about event sourcing is that it's been around for a long, long, long time. And almost no mature industries do not use event sourcing, conceptually. And when I say mature, I'm not talking about Groupon. So in researching for the book, I've actually gone back and traced the history of event sourcing. And I've traced it all the way back to Sumeria and Mesopotamia. And it's always funny when people say, so this new thing you want to show us, how do I convince my boss? It's like, it's been around forever. If you look at finance, accounting, um, go through and look at insurance, they don't keep a concept of current state. How many have a bank account? Do you think your balance is a column and a table? Or is your balance a first level derivative? It's an equation. It's a summation of all of the transactions that have happened on your account's value. What if it were just a column? That'd be a problem, right? Think about it, you disagree with your bank over what your balance is, so you call them up on the phone and say, hey, your balance is wrong. And they go, no, that's what the column says. The column is always right. But if we make it an equation, if you disagree with your bank, can you go and actually fill out the equation yourself by hand and say, the computer added the numbers wrong? In other words, we end up with a level of verifiability because it's an equation as opposed to just storing structure. This can be applied to any problem. And we're gonna look at how we can do that, and then we're gonna start getting into polyglot data. What's interesting for me when we start talking about event sourcing is that it's very rarely done for a technical reason. And there are some technical problems that it will do a great job at, but normally it's the business side that wants to get into event sourcing, not the technical side. So let's start off by looking at what I would call a typical structural model. Here we have a purchase order, it has end line items, and it has shipping information associated with it. How many of you have something like this in your system today? Could be a document, it could be tables in a database, but this is a structural viewpoint of data. We're looking at the structure of the data and the relationships between the data. This is not the only way of storing data. We can also store data as a series of facts that are happening at points in time. Here, we have a cart created, three items added, and shipping information added. Now, there's three items added. Those are three distinct events, but if I put them as three distinct events, the boxes got really little and you couldn't read them anymore. I can, at any point in time, take this stream of events and I can play it back, and I can give you that. But there's a lot of advantages to me only storing events and not storing my state. I don't store my structure. We could say that my structure becomes a transient concept. We project our structure off of our event stream. How many of you have written a SQL migration script before? That's always fun, right? By the way, I, I really hate having to version structure. And what scares the crap out of me is not that the version, uh, the migration will come across and then we'll try to bring everything up and it will fail. What scares the crap out of me is we're going to go through and do this and it's going to work perfectly fine for a week and then it fails. How many of you write migrations back to your old schema? And then you lose data and, well, we used to have a joke, so you'd have your choice at this point. You can either wear the fireman hat or the cowboy hat. Anybody will walk up to your desk, know that you're having a bad day and turn around and walk away. 
structure is difficult to version. It's very, very difficult to version, as all of you have found out. If you use a document database, this is one of the big problems with dealing with document databases. I need to change the structure of my documents while it's running. This'll be fun. We have less versioning problems when we start storing events. Events are good in terms of being able to store them, and there are an infinite number of possible structural models that I could project off of a given event stream. And this is one of the main values of actually storing events. You don't lose anything. How many of you have a structural model today? Okay, how many of you sat and chatted with the CEO and did cost-benefit analysis on data? Hmm, not too many people. How many of you guys have an update or delete statement in your system? How did you decide that data was worthless? When we talk about event streams, event streams are a lossless model. In fact, they are the only lossless model that you can possibly have. As a CTO, I had one rule. I would not lose any data. Do you know why? I have no freaking clue how to value it. How many of you can predict where your business will be a week from now? Month from now, year from now? What questions will they ask you about today? I was storing 100 gigabytes a day eight years ago. I just didn't know how to value any of it. Which costs more today, to store a gigabyte of data or a Coke? <laughs> how many events can you fit inside of a gigabyte worth of data? A lot. So can you derive more than a Coke's worth of value out of a gigabyte of data? Normally, yes. When you start, and I, I always get this question, so if we're gonna store everything, um, what do we do? Because we're gonna get lots and lots of data. Sure. But where do you sit in relationship to Moore's Law is a big question. And there's a, there's a related law, I forget the name of it, but it, it says basically that data speeds are actually growing faster than Moore's Law. If you are below the curve of Moore's Law, your data storage will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over time. So don't necessarily worry about it. It's only if you're growing faster than that in terms of your data collection that you need to worry. Now when we talk about this, because it's a lossless model, there is no concept of delete. There is no concept of update. And by the way, this works out really, really well for programmer pornography. Um, let's imagine I put events over HTTP. When do I set the cacheability for? They're immutable. Immutable events are really, really useful when you start talking about wanting to scale things. And it took me forever to find that first slide that we were looking at, this one. Because they're doing something there that only accountants at Enron do. <laughs> they're erasing in the middle of their ledger. You don't do this, and in event sourcing it's the same way. You never go back and change something once it's been done. If any of you have taken a university accounting class, you might have been told accounting is done in pen, not pencil. Why? Because you never go back and change something. Let's say I fat finger, and instead of sending you $1,000, I sent you $10,000. I just go back and erase one of the zeros, right? And everything's good. Of course, you know, the whole banks, and they, they don't mind this. They'll update as well. No, so what I'm gonna do as an accountant is I'm gonna do one of two things. I'm either gonna put in a journal entry and take $9,000 back from you. But accountants don't like doing this. The reason accountants don't like doing this is what happens when an auditor comes through this? What did you originally intend to do? So the auditor has to reverse engineer your journal entries to figure out what the original intention was. Instead, what they'll do is they'll do what's known as a full reversal. So I will take $10,000 back from you, and then I will put $1,000 as I originally intended to do. What happens for the auditor? Auditor comes through and he goes, oh, okay, well that was a mistake. This is what they actually intended to do. And with one account like this, or sorry, two accounts, it's not that difficult. What if there were six accounts involved? And now you've got six accounts with partial adjustments happening to them. We can do the same thing with event sourcing. So now we have a cart created, three items added, one item removed, and shipping information added. Is this the same as a cart created, two items added, shipping information added? That's a tricky question. I see some people going, yes. Some people going, no. And what's funny is it actually depends on your perception. What if we have this perception of the data? And this structural model, those two will come out exactly the same, correct? 
we will have a cart with two items added and shipping information added. By the way, this is a great trick that you can play with your, your systems at home. So if you can come up with any two sets of use cases that actually end up in the same structural model at the end, congratulations, you found out you're losing data. You don't have a perfect hash. Now for this one, those two will come out the same. What if I were to do one where we counted the removed items? Would they end up at the same endpoint? No, because this one would have a count of one, the other one would have a count of zero. This is also where a lot of the value starts coming into play, and it's the ability to go back in time that people really like. Let's try an example of this. So you can imagine that we are a company that does large online retail sales. I don't know if there's one or two of those in America. And our business guy comes to us and he says, you know what? I think when we start talking about a recommendations engine, the items that we recommend, they're good. But I think if somebody removes an item from their cart within five minutes before they check out, they're more likely to buy that item than they are the ones we've been recommending. Why? When do you remove an item from your cart five minutes before checking out? You go look at your cart and you're like, oh man, this is too expensive, my wife's gonna kill me. I should remove one or two things from my cart so you know, I keep my head. And it's not that I don't want those items, it's that I'm prioritizing those items lower compared to other items. You should still keep recommending them. So let's try doing it in this particular model. So what will we do here? We take the card off the board and we say, okay, we're gonna add a new thing there. It's gonna be called removed line items. And then we write a report that looks for removed line items and it does a subquery on that customer to see if they bought that item in the future. Seem reasonable? So we release it to production. Our business person goes and brings up his report. What does he see? Nothing. That report will start working from the moment we release it to production and it will go from that point in time forward. What if we did it with this model? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna write a projection. And the projection, what it's gonna do is it's gonna look for the line item removed. When it finds that, it's gonna say, I'm searching for the checkout. When the checkout happens, it says, was this within five minutes? If it was within five minutes, then it says, this is an item that met that, and look for it in the future, found equals false. Now, this will then run through in the future, and if it finds that item checked out of a cart, it'll mark found equals true. And I haven't told you guys this about projections yet, but when you run a projection against any of these kinds of event streams, what it has to do is it has to go to event zero and go all the way forward till now. So we release this to, produ to production, and then we write a report off of that little projected state that we built. What does our user see? Everything's there. It's as if the report's always been there. In fact, we can even go back and we can say, you know what, if I had this report on October 13th at 9.04 in the morning, what would it have told me if I had that report then? And yes, you can bring up any report at any point in time along the way. This is a major advantage of this style of storage. But there's lots of other cool things that you can do. It basically gives you the equivalent of a TiVo. You can take any perception that you come up with today and go back in time with that perception to any point in time that your system has ever been in existence. Real world way of thinking about this. Imagine to take your current perception of reality and bring yourself back into your 13 year old body at your first dance. And to be able to re-see everything at that point. There's some other cool things you can do with it because it's an append only model. One of them, you can, in some cases, avoid super user attacks. Super user attack is where you're going to say, I've got a rogue developer or administrator. They have root access and they want to attack me. That's a big problem, right? Actually, if you go back, I used to work with a company and there's an HBO special about this. Um, guy I was working with, he decided he's going to attack our gambling system. Um, we ran about 70% of the horse racing in America. So what he would do, we had a bet called a pick six. You have to bet six winners in a row, and then what will happen is if you win all six, you win, otherwise you don't. And normally the way people bet this is they bet many, many bets into the one pool. 
So they'll take the one, two, three, four, five, the four, three, seven, three, two, and they keep betting all these different combinations. And he ended up getting caught, but like most super user attacks, it was not because he was stupid. It was because he was unlucky. So what we would do is, because there were all these combinations of the bets, and there's literally, in a bet, there might be 400 combinations. And we were talking all over CSU DSUs. So what we would do is we'd hold them at the track that you made the bet at until after the fourth race. Then we would scan the ones to see who's still a possible winner, gets rid of 99% of your network traffic, and then ship those over. So what he was doing is he'd go and get on the IVR and bet one, two, three, four, all, all. Then he had watched the races while on the developer maintenance line. At the end of the fourth race, he would edit his bet on disk to be the correct first four. And he got caught, but it was because he was unlucky. Now, I'm trying to remember which race it was. Um, it might have been Breeders, Breeders Cup. It's one of, probably the fourth biggest race in America. And he did this, and then two 99 to one horses come in in the fifth and sixth legs. He is the only winning ticket in the world, and it's like a $1.6 million pool. Now, the mutual manager normally, if there's a pick six and there's you know, 200 winners, he's not gonna look at any of that crap. But if you have one winner, and his bet was one, two, three, four, all, all, on a combinatorial bet, no punter would ever bet this. They'd never even consider it, because it's combinatorial, and if any of your first four legs lose, your ticket's gone. So, oh, it came from cat skills. Well, let's get them on the phone. Anything interesting going on up there? Oh, you have a developer on the maintenance line. That's really interesting. <laughs> oh, your audit tape has been ejected. That's really interesting. <laughs> and then the FBI came and took him away, and I believe he is now out of federal prison. Actually, this company is in Delaware. I'm surprised people here have never heard about this story. Um, if you want to look it up, you can actually Google the name Chris Harn, and you, there's an hour-long HBO special about this entire incident. But using this model that we've been talking about, we could have avoided that. We could have put the data on a worm drive. Now, if I put my data on a worm drive, write once, read many, my current state is derived by my audit log. How do you get something into my current state without putting it in my audit log? My audit log is, by the laws of physics, only able to be written once, so you can't update it. Now, this isn't a primary use case, but it's a good one to remember if you happen to be in these kinds of highly regulated environments. Now, I don't want to spend the entire time today talking about event sourcing, but just really, really quickly, and why is that slide there? That doesn't make any sense. Okay. That's really weird. But if you have questions, feel free. Um, <laughs> And, and, and dear God, if I, if I happen to have like my fly down or something, please let me know before the end of the talk. Now there's a problem when we start talking about event source systems. If all I store is a series of events, how do you issue a query? Let's say, I want all the customers with the first name Greg. That won't work really well, will it? And this is where we start coming to polyglot data. Storing events works really, really well when we start talking about, I want to have a writing model. But it really sucks for reading models. All of these are different kinds of reading models, and they're all pretty cool. If you're not using these, you suck. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> now, when we start talking about this, and it's funny, you get into like the NoSQL versus SQL versus new SQL wars, you know what? Every database sucks, every single one of them, and they all suck in their own unique ways. I don't care what database you're talking about, it sucks. And this is where polyglot data starts coming into play. How many of you remember these? Object databases. They were gonna take over the world, right? Just like NoSQL. <laughs> Why didn't they? I mean, how many of you use an object database today? A decade ago, it was no one will ever use SQL ever again because we have object databases now. And object databases were really cool because they didn't have an, an impedance mismatch back to your domain model. And, well, frankly, because you were walking links as opposed to querying sets, they were about 10 times faster. So why don't you use them today? 
domain model changes all the time, and that can cause problems with an object database. Another big one, and this is what happened with everybody, because, you know, when you start off a system, you talk about all the transactional stuff and the beautiful domain model, and then there's this afterthought called reporting. And I put everything into an object database, and then my business guy, he came up with this really stupid idea. He wants me to sum up sales grouped by customer. And with my object database, I have to load up like 170,000 objects in order to actually go through this, and it takes like nine minutes. I need a new business guy. <laughs> so what we ended up saying was, object databases suck. They are absolutely terrible at doing OLAP behaviors, so therefore we should never use them. That makes a lot of sense. There's lots of examples like this, and you will watch people going off and using document databases, and then they want to do a really simple query where they do a group by, and they're like, I have to do a MapReduce across 20 servers where I could have done it in SQL Server just with one query. All databases suck in their own unique ways. Keep that in mind. And we run into huge problems when we start trying to take one model and force everything into one model. How many of you guys have used SQL before? How many of you like using ORMs with SQL? How many of you have been given a query before by your DBA? This is the query I want you to run, and all you need to do now is figure out how to get on a hibernate to actually make it. <laughs> Three days later, you manage to get the union query actually working. How many of you have used, let's say, SQL Server full text indexing? What do you think's better, that or Lucene? There's lots of examples of this where we want to have different models for different types of things that we want to do. And if you don't have multiple models, you're going to find yourself playing the game of trade-offs. Let's look at some examples. How many of you have heard of this small company before? Little startup. Okay, so what are they really underneath? They are a topic-based pub sub. How many of you would say, you know, I need to build a topic-based pub sub. I'm gonna ignore everything that the financial world has been doing for the last two decades, and instead I'm gonna build it with MySQL and Ruby on Rails. They got into massive accidental complexity because the way they wanted to look at the problem, they tried to force their problem into a certain set of tools. And this is very, very common. What about this one? How many of you have done this before? So we've got a table. It's got an ID, a parent ID, and then some data. And basically what we're doing here is we're building up a tree. Or I've worked with a company here in America, and this is actually a graph. What it was was they had a person's table, and then they had a relationship type table that would take two persons and say this is the relationship type between them. And then they want to be able to issue queries against that, things like um, I'm looking for connections from this person to this person based only on these relationship types. Please tell me the shortest path between them. Now, when you do this, then you release to production, and you get a call from the DBA going, yeah, that report you gave me, it's taking nine minutes to run. And you go, it works on my machine. What's the difference between your machine and in production? Well, on your machine, you've got 20 rows of data, and in production, they've got 150 million. And you have just built a recursive query. So, DBA comes back, and you're like, ah, stupid production. We'll fix them. So what we'll do is we'll use an ID, parent ID zero, parent ID one, parent ID two, parent ID three, parent ID four. And this way, if I want to get part of the tree, I can do an or query. So where ID equals or parent ID zero equals or parent ID one equals, it'll bring back all my data for me, and then in memory, I can just walk my tree really quickly and rebuild it. This is accidental complexity. And this is the kind of thing that you start running into when you don't think about using the right tool. Let's go back to that person and relationship type. What do you think is going to be better at that query, SQL Server or a graph database? You just poorly implemented a graph database inside of SQL Server. By the way, how many of you have a PhD in graph theory? Neo4j actually has like eight of them, and I never had someone raise my hand. That's actually really cool. <laughs> do you work for Neo4j by chance? Uh, no, I just have to come to us. Oh.
But this is accidental complexity. It's coming because we're choosing the wrong type of model. This choosing the wrong type of model causes massive amounts of accidental complexity inside of systems. And almost every system I go into where they have a single model, you can find this kind of crap laying all around. One of my favorites, using XML querying in SQL Server. Who thought this was a good idea? Now, one kind of separation that we happen to get inside of these kinds of models is writing versus reading. And we oftentimes want a different model for writing than what we would want for reading. It's also known as CQRS. We won't go into all the gory details. It's a really dead simple pattern. Now, when we start talking about queries inside of systems, queries are normally what you need to scale for most systems. And I'm going to take an important uh, uh, subset here and say financial systems are completely different. They're normally opposite. They have to read 100 million events in order to give somebody one query. But most systems, you have to scale your queries not your write processing. I've always laughed. Um, I guess about three years ago at QCon, they, they had a scalability track, and one of the groups I was talking up there was The Guardian. Okay, so with The Guardian, what happens? I put up a new article, and then somebody reads it. And then I update it, of course, right? So every time someone reads it, I update the article? Or do I put it up and then 100,000 people come and read it? How do you scale that? Hmm. Well, there's this little thing out there called Nginx. And I can just put that in front of me, and it does that for me, because I say it's cacheable. When we talk about reads, it's almost always the reads that we need to scale. Now, how many of you have a third normal form plus minus database right now? Let's say in SQL Server, you're somewhere between second and third. I like to call it a pragmatic third. You follow third except for it's annoying. And of course, if you, you occasionally end up because you're doing things like this, which isn't really first normal form, or third normal form. Now, what's interesting for me is almost all the systems I see are somewhere around third normal form. And then if you actually go and look at from there, uh, basically inside of SQL, what, how often are they changing data versus how often are they querying data? And it's something like two orders of magnitude to one. So there's 100 reads for every one update, and they optimize their data model for writing. That was smart, and they wonder why they have scalability problems. When we talk about this, we oftentimes separate, and we want a different model for writing than the model that we want to use for reading. This is one form of separation in terms of dealing with polyglot data. Now, for writing, just storing events is probably the simplest thing that you can possibly do. What's interesting is if you look at most databases, most databases work the same way. They have this thing called a journal, and they write down to the journal, what does keeping an appending series of events sound like to you? It's a journal. Now, internally, what they're doing then is they're reading off the journal, and they're going and updating some other structure, let's say a B tree. And then they query off the B tree. What's interesting about most databases is their querying ability, not their writing ability. Um, I went through and I showed our database and how our internal transaction engine worked. And after the talk, someone says, your transactional engine works just like Cassandra's, so your database is the same as Cassandra. It's called a log-structured merge. And SQLite uses it too, which means that SQLite equals Cassandra. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. Most databases work the same way internally. Now, when we talk about writing, all we really need to be able to do is append to a journal. And this is the exact same concept as what we are looking for for event sourcing. It's a really simple transactional model. And by the way, it's fast. You can easily hit 50,000 events per second on a single node. Easily. You can probably even easily hit 50,000 events per second on a replicated log to three nodes, as an example, if you want high availability. By the way, how many of you do more than 10 transactions per second? So for everybody else, we can run you on a mobile phone for writing. But you probably have a fairly heavy query load. And keep in mind, that's where we start talking about scalability. Now, this is one form of separation, but there's going to be other forms of separation. Another big form of separation I tend to find is time. 
How many of you have worked in finance before? Oh, quite a few. I'm actually surprised. I, I'd expect that in New York. So in finance, there is a business level difference in terms of time. There's intraday versus interday. And all the SLAs are completely different for everything between those two. Today is different than every other day in the history of the world. And where this comes into play is very often I end up wanting to have two different layers and I want to have two models. One model that's focused on stuff that's happening right now and one model that's focused on some period of time before. Um, perfect example of this, I was working with a company out in Lithuania. And for those that don't know, although I have a, no a lovely American accent, I do actually live in Lithuania. They had a large multivariate problem dealing with um, ads and doing ad placements with Google. Basically, they bid on the ad placements. And they were running with, uh, I guess, a 70 or 80 Amazon large high I.O. nodes to do a single MapReduce on the multivariate problem. And they would do it once per month. In other words, I want to figure out what the real numbers are on this multivariate in order for this user, given this kind of page, with this kind of interest, how much should I be bidding on it? What is the actual number there? Only one problem. It took 24 hours to run. How much money do you think it costs tw for 80 extra large high I.O. nodes in Amazon for 24 hours? I'll give you a hint, it was more than 10,000 euros a month to run one report. Can you imagine that? Only one problem, it's the most important report that they had, and the business guys, those silly guys, they wanted to run it every day. <laughs> so the question became, well, how do you do that then? And the answer was you introduce two models. You do one model, which was basically a, a, a form of complex event processing, on top of the big batch model. And what it would do is it would look for places where the big batch model that was run was obviously completely wrong and this data's been changed. And then it would do very fine slice queries back through that big multivariate problem. So what you had was a big data layer that did a massive batch job, and then you had a speed layer that was basically looking to invalidate things out of that big batch job. Again, we're going to use two models because two models here turn out better. And using time here allowed us to be able to do this. Very often when we look at our problems, we want to have two different data models based on time. One for things that are happening quickly, one for things that are happening in giant batches. There's lots of these scenarios where we can start finding ways and we want to separate between different kinds of data models. And event sourcing is going to help us with all this. Because one of the brilliant things about event sourcing is it allows us to bring on a new model at any point in time and ramp it up. If I want to bring up a graph database tomorrow, that's just a new projection, right? So I replay all my events historically, build up my new model. All of these models, they're just caches. Event sourcing makes it very easy for me to be able to do this. And it allows me to do it in a way that I can uh, stay agile, and I really hate the word agile now. How many have heard that the best time to make a decision is at the last responsible moment? You want to delay all your decisions. I don't want to have to think at the beginning of the project, you know, we may need a graph database in this. I don't want to have to think about that. If I've stored back all my events, I know at any point in time I can ramp up a new model and it will replay through its history and it will come up and it will work fine. Now, there's lots of people that try to do this stuff with multiple models. And almost certainly they end up failing. Very, very few people end up using event sourcing for this. So this is my typical slide of how people are gonna start doing this. So what they do is they bring up Hibernate. On, underneath their domain model, they write to a third normal form database, and then they start putting out events into a service bus. And then what they'll do is they'll put an OLAP model, a graph database, stream processing, and they'll all be connected back from the service bus. But this thing has a huge number of problems inside of it. And this will always fail in production. Let's take a re look at why. The first one's that third normal form database there. I know none of you guys would put bugs into code, but think about juniors. So what happens if I have a slight little bug, and what I do is I change the domain object to be a hard-coded Connecticut 
Whereas on the event, I actually put out the commands state that was given to me. What will happen to my OLAP model versus my third normal form model? Well, the third normal form model will say the state's Connecticut. The OLAP model will say it's Louisiana. Okay, cool. Now, how do you fix it when that happens? Do you open up a distributed transaction from the OLAP model back to the third normal form model? What if it was the other way around? I know what we'll do. We'll open up a distributed transaction from the third normal form model to the graph database. I'm sure this will turn out well. How do you detect that this problem has even happened? Reconciliation scripts? This is a huge problem that starts coming up. Another big problem that comes up in this model. What happens when I want to ramp up a graph database? How do you bring in a new model? Well, I guess I would write a migration from one of the old models and bring that into the graph database as a, a single migration, and then I'm going to listen to events from that point in time forward. Okay, so how do you do this with configuration in terms of things like queues? How do you get it so that the data I took to start migrating versus my queue are at exactly the same point? It's tricky, and you have to write a big one-off migration script for this, and then you have to write all the code that listens to the events to keep it updated into the future. So basically, you have to do twice the work. All of this is going to change if we go back and we start looking at an event source system. From an event source system, what we're gonna say is that all of those models there, they're just projections. They listen to events as they come along, and they update into their own models, just like any other projection. It just happens to be that they're persistent. They're not being done in memory. They're still transient. And by the way, for those of you with a functional background, um, when we talk about event sourcing, what we really say is that current state is a left fold of previous behaviors. And if you can understand that, then you understood everything about event sourcing that you need to understand. And it's a much shorter version than actually going through and talking about events and how they replay. And... But all of those, they're just following that event stream, and they're updating into a persistent model, and then people can query that persistent model. It's a really, really simple idea. But where it starts to shine is that we no longer have the problem that we had with that third normal form database. The problem that we were running into when we were here is that we had two sources of truth in our system. We had the third normal form database, and then we had our event streams. What happens when our two sources of truth disagree with each other? Who do you listen to? Once we've moved to this, that OLAP model, that GraphDB, stream processing, those are all just caches, nothing more. They're transient. And by the way, you'll have a lot of fun with this if you happen to build out one of these systems. Your DBA will have done a backup, let's say the backup's an hour old, and he's like, well, okay, catastrophic failure, we're gonna lose one hour's worth of data, and business goes, yay! And then you go, we can get it back. We'll get back all the data and not lose anything. And they go, how do you do that? And you go, shh, don't worry about it. Because all I have to do is replay my events, correct? And I only have one source of truth in the system now. My one source of truth is my events. This is a completely event-centric system. My audit log is my main storage, which is also my integration model. I can ramp up or down as many different types of read models as I want. I can do it easily. If I want to blow away my, my graph database, can I rebuild it? Make it faster, better, stronger? What about when you start talking about things like migration scripts over time? So instead of going through and actually updating my current model, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put a new model next to it. And it may take the entire weekend to rebuild that new model, but that's fine, it's asynchronous. Once that new model's built, I'm gonna switch the new model and the old model, and then destroy the old model. Well, to be fair, I'll probably leave it running for like a couple days until I feel secure that I don't need to roll back. What happens when I get a new model here? Do I have any special configuration of queues that need to be done? Or does it just start at event zero and start moving forward? What's the migration I need to write on that new model when it comes in? Nothing. 
You just write the event processing the same way it's going to be happening as live, and you just start it from the beginning of time. Do your event processors care whether an event happened one millisecond ago or one year ago? They shouldn't. Chances are I'm doing something like inserting into a table. It doesn't matter whether this is a historical event or whether it's an event that just happened, because all events are facts that happened in the past anyway. Keep this in mind when you're designing events, by the way. You should never make an event that says something like batch job running. Because what happens when you replay that? Is the batch job still running? I don't know. It's always batch job started, batch job ended. They always end um, as verbs in the past tense. But this makes it much, much easier for me. All I have to do is ramp up a new model. The, the new model is completely independent of any of the other models. It just goes back to the very first event and starts coming forward from that point in time. It runs things right now the same way it would have been running them a year ago. It doesn't care. And this also brings us back to the idea that we were talking about before the event sourcing, of being able to go to any point in time along the way. How many have had to do predictive modeling before? So I need to write something that's going to predict the future. Great way of doing this is what's known as an alpha beta search. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have two walks through that log. The first one's job is to predict the second one. The second one is always one week in front of the first one. And that's how you do your training. You just keep the two going through the log. I can also bring up, let's say, a new graph database, and I can bring it up to any point in time that the system's ever had. How many have had to deal with regulators before? Wouldn't it be really cool to be able to bring up your reporting database and say, so when they made that decision, this is what the reporting database looked like. You can run all the reports yourself. And I can bring this to any point in time along the way. Regulators love this stuff. Now, I just want to go through and summarize some of the things we've been going through today. The first one is that using the wrong model will cause a ridiculous amount of accidental complexity inside of your system. All you have to do to see this is go through and try using XPath querying inside of SQL Server. It's just the wrong tool. Now, I, before we go too much into this, I, I want to give you guys the other side of this as well. So I am not saying that you should go off and you should bring nine databases into your organization. What I'm saying is that using, the, using different databases can oftentimes make your, your problem simpler, but the downside of this is operational complexity. If I bring MongoDB into your organization, somebody needs to know what the hell MongoDB is. Somebody needs to know what to do when MongoDB loses their data. Not that this ever happens. By the way, does anyone here follow Big Data Borat? He's absolutely hilarious. I think the best tweet he's ever done was when MongoDB took on, it was like 100 million capital, and he tweeted, um, um, what is valuation of MongoDB? Um, it was uh, partition one says 100 million, partition two, or replica set two says 200 million, replica set three says three million. Now, the other side of all of this is operational complexity. Somebody needs to know how to back that stuff up. Somebody needs to know how to monitor it. Someone needs to know how to actually deal with it. Now, if I came into your organization, you told me, you know what? We are using SQL Server full text indexing. And I went, okay, cool. Um, why didn't you use Lucene? Since you're bringing me in about a performance problem with that decision. We didn't use Lucene because we evaluated the operational complexity and we didn't have the staff in terms of operations that understood Lucene at the time. Cool, that is a rational decision. What I normally hear from people is, so why didn't you use Lucene? And they go, what's Lucene? Understand that I'm not saying that everyone should have 10 databases inside of their systems. What I'm saying is we need to look and we need to remember that we can use multiple data models. And using things like event sourcing can make it easy to use multiple data models. When we were talking about event sourcing, storing immutable data in logs is a really, really good write model. It's simple, people understand it, it's been around for decades, actually I should say for eons. 
it works really, really well. And when you talk about your database, your database most likely is doing it internally anyway. All you're doing is saying we're going to do it externally so that we can have multiple read models reading off of our transaction log as opposed to having one read off of our transaction log. We tend to find separation in models between reads and writes, but it's not the only form of separation. Another very common one is going to be time. And if there's one thing I want everybody to walk away from this talk with, it's that all databases suck. I don't care what your favorite database is, it sucks in its own unique ways. Now, perhaps in your problem, its suckage isn't apparent. And it seems to work reasonably well. But no matter which model you're using, I can give you problems that it will suck at. Trying to pick one form of storage that will go through and handle everything for you, it, it's basically a fail. It's not gonna work. Understand that different types of problems can be more easily solved in different types of models. And the ability, for instance, to bring in a graph database. I have watched teams working on graph-like problems take an estimate from nine months to two weeks because they discovered a graph database and they didn't have to poorly implement one inside of SQL anymore. This is a huge win when we start looking at a lot of these kinds of systems. So please take away that your database sucks. No, take away that there is no best form of storage. And with that, I will thank you guys. It's been great to actually be out here. Um, if people have questions, we can ask them now, or if more likely everybody's itching because they wanna go grab a beer, you can ask me later and I will be around and feel free. And thank you.